Okay, welcome to our video on a dipole's behavior in an electric field. Just a quick reminder that a dipole is any arrangement of charge that has two poles, uh, and they have to have equal magnitude charge. So equal magnitude of charge, right? So for example, it could be a very a small particle system uh, where you have a proton and an electron, or perhaps a positron and electron. Um, those, by the way, are very different scenarios. Let's take a look at the two that I just mentioned. If it's a proton and an electron, then they have the same ch uh, charge magnitude. This is positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, and this is negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Um, and because they have very different masses, uh, we know that the proton is so much heavier than the electron, we would expect the center of mass to be much closer to the proton. But the charges are the same, even though the mass of the proton is much bigger. Okay, the other possibility is that I mentioned also, the other possibility is that this is a positron. We indicate that with an E+. Plus. And when we're dealing with positrons and electrons, we want to make sure we label one of them E-. minus. Okay, so again, the charges are still the same as in, they are in red there. See, they're still negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs for the negatively charged object, which is the electron, and positive 1.6 times 10 to the 19th coulombs for the positively charged object, the positron. But now their masses are exactly uh, the same magnitude. So the center of mass, I suppose, would be in the very center, if that makes sense. Okay, also, uh, dipole doesn't have to be made up of tiny particles. Uh, you could have two charged spheres separated by a piece of wood etc. So dipole just means two equal magnitude charges, one on each end, separated by distance d. Okay, so in the dipole drawings, we just kind of draw them generically like this and put a d there. Okay, now you'll know, notice that uh, there are field lines that start on the positive charge and terminate over on the negative charge, right? All of which are curved except the one in the middle, right? In fact, um, all of these uh, field lines contribute a net field to this overall scenario, and uh, we've talked about that before. Um, but today we want to discuss a new topic, uh, the dipole moment. And the dipole moment is a small, or is, is a, a separate vector altogether, um, pointing from the negative side to the positive side, okay? Uh, we call it P, so its name is P. And its magnitude is Q times D. So you just pick uh, one of the endpoint charges, say Q. Um, the other one's, you know, negative Q. But just pick the magnitude Q, times it by D, the distance between them. That is your magnitude of the dipole moment. Now, uh, this means that if you want to make a large dipole moment, then either make a large charge on the ends or separate them by a large distance. So it's the product of charge and distance. The bigger the charge, the bigger the distance, the bigger the dipole moment magnitude. Okay, also, I mentioned it points from the negative to the positive, which is the reverse of the field lines, as you notice there. You'll see why that's important later. Okay, so that's um, the P vector, and just drawn all by itself, it points from the negative end to the positive end of the dipole, right along the axis there. Okay, now, when you stick a dipole into an electric field, um, it's going to move, uh, most likely. All right, and... Um, Let's just focus on a uniform electric field, and let's just say for the sake of argument that it points directly to the right. I'm putting all the field lines equidistant from the next field line. So this is just to sort of indicate that this is a uniform electric field, a uniform electric field here in blue. And then we'll put our little red dipole in here in this situation. And we'll go ahead and put the positive charge at the bottom and the negative charge at the top. Okay, so if you put a dipole into an electric field, it's going to actually um, not necessarily move sliding-wise, but it will move in a rotation sense, okay? And the reason is, um, right now, the center of mass should, shouldn't be too much of a concern. Uh, the sum of the forces in the x direction on this center of mass is zero, okay? So just looking at the system altogether, think of this as one neutrally charged object, right? Because you have a charge that's positive charge that's negative, remember the negative charge is going to want to uh, approach the tail of the, 
of the, um, uh, the, the blue field lines. So the, the tails of the blue field lines are over here, right? Those are really positive charges of some kind over there. We're not going to consider their nature too much, but you understand that the green, <coughs> the green force there is uh, the force vector felt by the electrically negative charge, and it's going to be drawn towards the origin of these field lines because the assumption is that these are positive over here, of course. Okay, so you're going to feel a pull that way, but you're also going to feel a push to the right. So Mr. Shore probably should have drawn the tails of the uh, the vectors there in green at the center of mass. So what is the overall left-right tendency of the dipole? We would say uh, zero. Okay, now this is uh, assuming that that it's completely uniform, even in a left and right sense. Okay, so don't, don't worry too much about the translation. I don't think we have a net force in the horizontal. However, because of the angle of tilt on this thing, we do have a torque, a torque. Okay, so let me redraw this again real quick. Kind of just clean this up a bit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, you kind of saw that the upper negatively charged particle is being kind of pulled to the left while the lower charged, positively charged particle is actually being pulled to the right. So I only have three colors to work with, but we're talking about these two forces. So with those two forces um, acting on different endpoints of a rotationally capable object, you're going to have a net torque. So what's going to happen is you, if you throw this barbell in there, it's going to want to straighten out and eventually come to a state of rest where it is completely horizontal. So it's going to actually look like this once it settles in the field. It's going to want to orient itself with its negative charge here and then its positive charge over here. Okay, now will it, will it be able to align itself that well? Well, it's going to have some kind of oscillation. So it's going to it's going to swing, and then it's going to go past, and then it's going to come back, and it's going to swing. It's probably going to go into some kind of uh, simple harmonic motion. Okay. Now, um, this is kind of what happens in a microwave. Your textbook does mention that. And so what happens is the, the water molecules um, are made of a hydrogen and another hydrogen and an oxygen, right? As you know, H2O. And then there's, there's kind of a triangular arrangement to all this with 105 degrees between these two blue, the acute angle, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the shorter, the smaller angle between the two blues, there is actually 105 degrees as measured uh, by the scientists. So what we know then is that um, there is sort of more of a positive charge at the hydrogen end of this triangle and more of a negative charge at your, um, oxygen end okay because remember hydrogen basically consists of uh, just a proton and, and then once the once the uh, uh, once the bonds are made uh, we do end up with a net positive charge in the end of this molecule on the upper side there and then on the lower side a negative okay so since there's a lot of water in our food when you put this into a microwave machine um, there is a purposely designed E field, see the blue field lines um, in our original arrangement. Imagine if those were not uh, only, you know, left to right, if these field lines could somehow keep changing, what would happen is the water molecule would vibrate, trying to keep up with the alignment. It would just continue to try to align itself with the field. And since the field is changing, maybe via some kind of a motor or something, um, then you would see that the water molecule would be quite agitated in its efforts to, to settle down. And so what you end up doing is releasing a lot of, a lot of heat, a lot of uh, radiation, or uh, I should say, you excite the water molecules to a state of high energy. And so the food gets hot very, very quickly. And uh, that's kind of the theory behind, behind the microwave, okay? Um, okay, there's probably more to that, right? But that's kind of an idea. And so what we're seeing here is that there's going to be a net rotational force. And the, atom, the uh, dipole is going to want to settle down, negative end on the left, positive on the right. Um, if you can slowly help it uh, into this position, then it won't oscillate. It'll just kind of rest there in a state of equilibrium. 
Will it slide left or right? That question came up in class. Again, I don't really want to worry too much about that, if, uh, whether it's closer to the left side or the right side or whatever, what's it going to want to do? But we're talking rotation today. Okay, so usually when we're trying to study conservative forces and quantify them, um, we would be most interested in s perhaps starting in this state of rest, uh, rotational rest, and then sort of deviating from the state of rest and trying to see how much energy is required to cause that deviation. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to purposely try to tilt it back upright through an angle theta. In fact, I'm going to go all the way to 90 degrees uh, trying to tilt this thing straight up again. Okay, and I'm going to quantify how much work that would require, and then that's going to tell me how much potential energy gets stored back into the field dipole system um, through my efforts. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to be able to figure out the, uh, the, the um, I guess you could say, the potential energy at any arrangement, even if it's tilted some angle between 0 and 90. So you'll see how this all comes about in a minute. Okay, so I already made a comment about the next sentence. It says that the sum of the force in the x direction is zero. No net force means the center of the dipole will not move. Um, however, we do expect that rotation. So I guess I already commented on that bullet earlier. Okay, the torque though is going to be present. So um, you probably remember torque as basically R cross F is probably how you remember it. And um, R cross F is basically uh, the generic formula for torque, right? You take your moment arm times your force, uh, and but you do it in a vector multiplication sense. So I just want to remind you of a couple of quick comments about uh, vector multiplication in the for form of a cross product, okay? So this is the most advanced type of multiplication we have in high school math, um, except maybe matrices. And uh, really, vectors are just, um, you know, n by 1 matrices or 1 by n matrices. They're either row matrices or column matrices. But my point is, uh, if you want to multiply r times f, you might remember something like this. What's going to happen is you're going to use the right-hand rule. Uh, man, that's a really bad drawing. Mr. Shah is going to try to draw right hand with a thumb like this fingers curled around like this. Imagine this is a right hand. So here's the thumbnail. Right there. Okay. Um, you, when you sweep R into F with your right hand, you actually have to turn your hand upside down. Okay, so man, can I even draw this? Let's see here. The thumb's going to point sort of into the board. Uh, the fingers are pushing R into F. Uh, this is supposed to be the palm. I don't know. I can't draw it. I can't really draw it. But uh, if you convince yourself with the right hand rule, um, if you remember that rule, uh, you'll see that the uh, torque vector is going to point directly into the page. So we use an X for that. Remember, this is out of page. This is into the page. Okay. So it's going to point into the page, and um, it's going to have a certain length, right? It's going to be poking into the page, and it's going to have a certain length. Well, how long is it? Well, it turns out that it is identical to the area. Its length is identical to this area here, right here, this parallelogram area here in the paper plane. Interesting. So the red arrow pokes into the board, but uh, with only a length equal to the area of this parallelogram. And uh, if you look at this parallelogram closely, and you consider that the angle between the tails is theta, you might be convinced that the area of any situation, like any uh, parallelogram in this situation, is basically just fr sine theta, because uh, this distance right here is this blue segment, is opposite theta and under a hypotenuse r. So this is just r sine theta. And then the area of any parallelogram is just base times high. So you take f times r sine theta. So what I'm trying to convince you of is that you don't really need r cross f for most of physics for the magnitude of the red arrow pointing into the board. Okay, You only need to know it's r f sine theta. So this is the magnitude of the torque. Okay, Most people just kind of memorize that r f sine theta. 
Okay, now in our situation, uh, we're not really using R and F, um, we're using P and E. Okay, so at least let me convince you from a unit standpoint that that makes sense. So we have R, F, sine theta, right? Uh, we're not going to consider forces, we're going to consider fields. So remember that the, fee the force is really just field times Q, right? And I'm not getting too carried away with this, but um, hopefully you can at least believe me that RQ here is like our dipole moment. Remember we said above that the little P dipole moment is dimensions charge times distance. So this is just really Q and uh, we have E. I'm sorry, not Q, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's P. It's P and it's E and it's sine theta. So Mr. Shore is not going to be using um, RF sine theta. He's going to be using PE sine theta um, just because it's a little more uh, convenient in our situation. So I don't want to get too into the drawing of that, but just trust me in that torque is RF sine theta or in our case, PE sine theta. We would rather use P and E, okay? All right, now, um, we also know, oh, I guess there was two things to write here. My bad, my bad. Uh, this, so this is uh, P cross E, which is sort of the equivalent of R cross F. And then uh, we can also, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So the, erase the magnitude, my bad. Okay, the vector is P cross E. The magnitude of the torque vector is P E sine theta. That's what I want to write. Okay, now what about potential energy? Well, uh, you you might also remember that the work done is always the integral of the force times the distance. But that's if you're sliding something. If you're turning something, force gets replaced with torque and displacement gets replaced with theta. Yeah, I think I said distance. I meant to say displacement. S is displacement. But work is, uh, in the rotational work sense, uh, force becomes torque and uh, ds becomes d theta because we're not sliding a ds, we're turning a d theta. Okay, so we're going to need this formula here. Also, you might remember that um, work is going to provide a change in kinetic and potential energies. In other words, mechanical energy is affected by the work we do. If we apply a lot of work, we will change the mechanical energy of the system by a lot. And if we apply a little bit of work, we, have changed the, we change the mechanical energy by a little. In fact, the amount of work we do in a system, on a system, is going to equal the exact amount of mechanical change in energy. Okay, so you probably remember that concept anyway. And we're not doing any problems with that, but I want you to remember that concept. Okay, so um, since I'm twisting something from a state of rest into a state of sort of disrest or unrest, right? Since Mr. Shore is trying to literally rotate this along the green angle into an upright position, right? Um, sorry, the negative charge is at the top. Yeah, uh, since I'm trying to do that, I'm going to have to resist, you know, I'm going to actually have to put work into this, resisting the, uh, the tendency of the dipole to align itself. I'm resisting that and forcing it upright. So before it moves, there's no kinetic energy. Once I let go of it, there's no kinetic energy. So really the, the work I'm doing is, I guess, changing the potential energy and the kinetic energy. But when it's all said and done, um, We've got our gun cocked, so to speak, or you could say our, our dipole uh, misaligned. It's ready to spring, right? Um, what's happened here is it is not really moving. So imagine if we turned it really slowly, right? Didn't add a lot of kinetic energy, but now it's straight up and it's got, a, it's got potential energy. It's got ability to do work, right? Okay, so the amount of work we put in is going to be the opposite of the potential energy that we get. So this right here, work, is opposite of U, change, change in U, okay? So change in U is usually U final minus U initial. Um, we're going to get the opposite of that. So I'm not going to get into the conservation law here real quick, but the idea is if you apply a positive amount of work, you're going to go from a state of low energy to high energy in this situation. Therefore, U final minus U initial is actually going to be a positive number. And then the negative out front is going to make it a negative. So you can have a negative potential, um, which is, is going to explain the, the positive motion. So uh, don't worry too much about the conservation law. And I hope I didn't confuse you or 
even say something wrong. What I'm trying to say is this, the potential energy change, u f minus u i, is the opposite of the work. In other words, it's the opposite of the integral of the torque d theta. That's all I wanted to say. And um, how much work we get depends on how far we twist it. We're going to be going from theta equals 0 to theta equals 90. Okay. If we run this little formula, we're going to find ourselves having a potential energy formula. In other words, if we do the integral. Okay, so we just saw earlier that torque was equal to PE sine theta. We're going to put that in right here. Okay, so it's going to look like this. And it's PE sine theta d theta. The P is a basically a physical feature of the dipole, and it does not depend on theta. And E is a physical feature of this system, and it has nothing to do with the dipole. So twisting theta doesn't change the E field or the P. Uh, it only changes theta and sine theta, right? So basically, I'm going to pull the PE out of the integral. This often happens in basic physics, and so you, you really end up with simple antiderivatives and stuff. Oh, and Mr. Shore forgot to carry his negative. We have a negative out front. Let's put it out front. Um, and then we're going basically from theta equals 0 to theta equals 90. And I'm going to run out of room, but oh well. Um, we have negative PE. What's the antiderivative of cosine? Be careful. I'm sorry. What's the antiderivative of sine? Be careful. What function has derivative sine? Yes, it's negative cos, right? Okay, and then uh, at the bottom here we have a 0, at the top here we have a 90. Okay, so we plug in the 90 first, and we get nothing, we get 0. And then we plug in the 0, and we get negative 1. So we get basically 0 minus negative 1. So Mr. Short just ran out of room. I'm going to carry my work back up to the top. Okay, so I just got negative PE, and plugging in the 90 gives me negative 0. Oh, that's just 0. And then plugging the 0 gives me negative 1. But it was subtracted, so this goes away, and we get positive 1 here. And we just end up with negative PE for the total amount of work. Okay? PE. All right, so that's the uh, amount of work that Mr. Shore just put in. Right? That's how, mu how much work I just put in. Okay, now, what if you don't go all the way to 90? You know what I'm saying? Like, what if you just kind of stop before you get to 90? So let's kind of run through it again. This time for the upper limit, let's not use 90. Let's just pick an arbitrary stopping angle. So let's say theta equals theta final, right? So then all through our work, instead of a 90, there'd be a theta final. Instead of a 90, there's a theta final. And right here, this would be a theta final. So what would happen is you would end up basically with this in the end, uh, what is it? It'd be negative cosine of theta final minus negative 1. OK, we're going to twist it the other way. Go back, delete everything. Go back, delete everything. Up into the point where I started talking about the um, uh, I started talking, uh, you got to listen to the last 15 seconds. Okay, go back, listen to like the last 20 seconds. We got some cropping to do here. All right. You, you've got to twist it the other way. You got to twist it from the state of 90 to the state of theta or something. Okay, now when a dipole is in an electric field, E, its behavior can be completely defined in terms of the vectors E and P. Now, E is the field vector. Oops. Yeah, e is the field vector. Uh, here. E is the vector field here. And uh, just basically, you can see that uh, it points only to the right. So Mr. Shore is going to make a really simple field arrangement. No curved field lines or anything. Just nice and straight, equally spaced. Uh, this means that no matter where you put a test charge, blah, 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 it feels the same basic force, OK? equal magnitude field at all possible positions. OK, uh, if you throw a, f a dipole in here, let's say like this, right? 
and let's say it's tilted at an angle theta to the field lines, um, it's going to want to turn itself. Um, and the reason is, let's just say that the negative charges on this end, positive charges on this end. Um, the reason it's going to want to turn itself is because basically when you put a positive charge, which is this uh, red end of the dipole, when you put a positive charge in a right directed E field, it's going to be pulled to the right. And the assumption is, of course, that there's positive charges over here uh, causing these field lines in the first place. So there's a repulsive effect in the particle on the right, uh, top right there, that uh, positive charge wants to literally move to the right. So it's going to want to go this way, if that makes sense. Okay. Meanwhile, um, the lower left part of the dipole there is going to want to go uh, to the left like this. Because the assumption is, again, it's being pulled to those positive source charges on the left. So don't worry too much about the source charges. But I think what's going to happen here is you're going to get a rotation. The dipole is going to want to rotate until um, it's totally in rest. Now, <laughs> if you just kind of hold it in this arrangement, um, it's not really in a stable situation. But if you kind of lay it flat slowly, lay it flat slowly, in the E field, um, it will be uh, at rest. So if you kind of lay it down like this along the direction of the field, it's going to be at rest. Uh, in fact, it's in a state of stable equilibrium right now. If you bump it, it'll oscillate around its center of mass um, back and forth. Okay. Now, uh, we would like to kind of study a situation where we start with the the dipole straight up and down, which is not really a stable uh, position for it. But we'll start with our dipole standing upright like this. So I guess you could say theta is like 90 degrees, right? Theta is like 90 degrees. OK. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to lay it down. So we're going to lay it down. So this is the positive end and this is the negative end. Uh, we're going to lay it down, uh, letting it slowly turn clockwise. So we'll kind of manage the movement, but we'll we'll lay it down until it's flat, like we showed earlier. I need a little more space. So. OK, so that's the before picture. Here comes the after picture. We're going to lay it flat like this. OK? So I guess theta then would be 0. Now, while we're doing that motion, it's going to be at some intermediate position at all times, right? It's going to be, as we're tilting it down, it's going to be like, you know, this or whatever, as we're tilting it. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to look at it. I want to look at how much force, or not force, but um, I want to look at the amount of uh, potential energy change we would have if we did this and we, con we went from theta equals 90 to like theta equals theta final, if that makes sense. Okay. All right, so the first thing we have to remind ourselves of, of is that uh, we don't really care about left and right shifting here, OK? The reason is, uh, technically, you have a neutral object in a, in a blue field. Like, this whole object is technically neutral. So it's not going to have any tendency, perhaps, to slide left and right. That question came up in class. Um, and don't worry too much about how, how close are the source charges of this electric field. But just looking at the red thing, um, it's totally neutral. It's in a field. It's it's not going to really have as much left and right impulse as it is going to have a rotational one. So try not to worry too much about the sum of the forces in the x direction. The sum of the forces in the x direction is ultimately we're going to treat it as zero, whether it is exactly or not. We're just going to treat it as zero. Um, no net force on the center mass. In other words, it's not going to slide or translate. It's going to rotate only around its center of mass. OK. Um, the second thing is you have to remember how torque works. So the way you probably remember torque is it's r cross f r cross f, OK? And um, that's a very complicated thing. So let, what we're saying is, uh, let's say that you have uh, a wall. And then on the wall, there's a door like this. So this is the door between two walls. And you apply a force on the door, let's say like this. OK. So this is the force vector that you're applying. You're pushing on the door. 
I'm not saying it's like a 90 degree is the door. I'm just saying it's some angle. And uh, there's a tendency for this door not to slide, but to turn. Okay, so you're providing a force, but it's going to only manifest itself kind of as a torque. Okay, so there is another vector here called the R vector. And that's from the hinge of the door to the point of your force. So let's say you're pushing on the edge of the door just to make it simpler. So what happens is you have this vector called R and this vector called F, and right now they're head to head. So what you have to kind of do is move the force vector so that its tail is on the tail of R. So put R here like this and the force vector like this. And uh, just kind of redrew it a little bit. But uh, what happens is the torque magnitude, um, I'm sorry, the torque vector, I mean, is going to be pointing in a direction determined by the right-hand rule of this system. Okay, so R cross F, if you remember the right-hand rule, you'd have to actually turn your right hand upside down like this. So here's your palm. And uh, you would bend your fingers in the direction. Oh, I actually did do that right. Mr. Short, I think he drew it wrong. You need to push R into F. Yeah, you need to push R into F. So what ends up happening is you get a torque vector that's pointing um, in the direction of this blue arrow. Okay, so don't worry too much about torque directions. It's actually just easier to work on that stuff in class. We can hold up our right hand and figure out the torque direction. But uh, in this particular door slash pushing scenario, uh, what would happen is you'd get a torque pointing straight down along the, uh, the hinge line. <laughs> so the door is hinged on this line and the torque is along that line. So that's the torque vector. It's very complicated, okay? Um, but that arrow has a specific length, okay? That arrow has a specific length. And if you want to know how long is my torque vector, what you can do is draw a parallelogram um, right here. Uh, let, let me draw a more generic picture. I think it'll be easier for you to see. So let's say you have a vector R here and a vector F here, and then the torque vector is pointing straight up. That might be easier to draw. Okay, if you want to know how long exactly is my torque vector, uh, what you have to do is find the area of this parallelogram down here. So if you were in my pre-calc class, I made a really big deal about this um, last year. But see that, that parallelogram's area is the same length as the green arrow. Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to highlight them in yellow. This area measured in square units is the same size as this length measured in linear units. Interesting. Okay, so that's all very complicated. But geometrically, it's quite easy to find the area of a parallelogram in this situation. So here's the parallelogram viewed from the top. This is R, this is F. And if you look closely at this situation, there's a little Sokotoa triangle in here. And the height of it is F sine theta. Because that, that uh, vertical distance that I'm making bold right now is basically opposite the theta. So you end up with F sine theta. And then what is the area of any parallelogram? It's just base times height. So it's just R times F sine theta. So it turns out that the area of this parallelogram is R F sine theta. That also happens to be the length of the green arrow. Okay, so that's all very complicated. But what I'm trying to say is for most of basic physics, you don't need to worry too much about cross multiplication and all the determinants involved but you can just think of the magnitude of the torque, and that is just R F sine theta, okay? Now, there's actually two torques going on. There's a torque on the positive charge, and that is being uh, uh, operating, you know, clockwise, and then there's a torque on the negative charge, and that's sort of counterclockwise, and... Um, the book kind of explains this, but when you add the two torques, you have one torque that rotates this way, and you have one torque that rotates counterclockwise. So these little arrows, this is supposed to look like a little counterclockwise uh, and a counterclockwise. Um, and that's sort of your sum of the torques. And uh, so everything is based on the center of mass. So uh, Mr. Shore will put the black dot back in. The black dot is here. Let's just say the center of mass is closer to the negative charge for some reason. Uh, this distance might be x. The other distance would be d minus x, right? Because the length of the dipole is d. So what you would do is you would say, all right, my force is qe, right? So you go qe 
times the distance x times sine theta and then plus uh, Mr. Shor's markers don't work too well on the edge of the screen and then plus and then you have for the other one basically QE again but this time it's D minus X sine theta so you're adding the two torques uh, together so what happens is um, and by the way, one is positive, one is negative, but the charges are opposite also. So uh, technically the clockwise one, if we call that the positive direction, uh, then the other is, one's the negative direction, but then the charge is also negative, remember? So it ends up being a plus anyway. So Mr. Shor is just going to write Q E X sine theta plus Q E D minus X sine theta. And if you distribute this out, you get Q E X sine theta plus Q E X Oh, sorry, plus QED minus QEX sine theta. And you just basically end up with, uh, oh, Mr. Shore wrote it wrong. It's, uh, hold on. I think I wrote it wrong. It's QEX sine theta. And then you have a QED sine theta. I forgot my little sine theta there. Uh, I'll highlight my mistake. It's right here. I forgot to distribute the. Oh, I know what I did wrong. <laughs> I put my parentheses in the wrong place. See this parentheses in red? That's where it's supposed to go. There we go. Uh, yeah, so you basically have a Q E D sine theta, and then you have a Q E X sine theta, and uh, the Q E X sine theta is cancel. Okay, so you end up with Q E D sine theta, Q E D sine theta, and this is the total torque. Okay, the total torque. All right, if you look closely at it, it makes perfect sense. Um, the QD right here is our new vector P. Remember, we talked about the, the dipole moment. So now we can rewrite this as QP. Oh, I was going to write that in green. QP sine theta. So whereas torque is usually thought of as arc F sine theta, uh, what am I saying? I meant to say phooey, Mr. Shore, phooey, phooey. Uh, the QD is our P. It's EP sine theta. So I'll still write my P vector in green. This is why we use pencil, right, guys? Okay, so EP sine theta is the equivalent of RF sine theta. It's the same exact thing. Okay, it's the same exact thing. So I kind of glossed over that in class, but now I kind of explained that a little better. Okay, so I'm going to go back and uh, kind of fill in some of these notes because that's probably all you really care about ultimately. Uh, so torque technically is P cross E, which is basically the equivalent of R cross F. And then uh, that turns out to be in magnitude sense, if you're just looking at magnitude, it's just P E sine theta. Man, that was a lot to, a lot to explain. But um, Let's say that you, are, you do move the dipole then from this vertical state to this diagonal state, right? So how much, uh, how much potential energy change would there be? Well, we can look at the work done. So remember, work is equal to the change in potential energy plus the change, uh, sorry, the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. In other words, it's K final minus K initial plus U final minus U initial. Uh, did I say that correctly? Um, actually, I probably uh, should look at it. It's, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of this. Yeah, it's the opposite of this. Okay, so there's a negative out front. Uh, remember, work is equal to the opposite of the change of energy. So if I apply a work on the system, then that's going to increase the uh, the energies of the system. So you can go back and look at your conservation laws from earlier if you don't believe me, but there's that negative outside. Uh, K final and K initial are equal uh, because we're not really moving this thing quickly. We're, we're taking it from a state of rest to a state of rest. So we're going to stop the motion. Um, we're sort of managing the motion. We're not letting it go free, okay? We're just trying to manage the motion. Okay, so we end up with this little statement that work is equal to basically U initial minus U final. Uh, I wrote it wrong. U initial minus U final. Okay. 
All right. And you also probably remember that work is defined as the integral of force dot displacement, but we're not sliding anything. We're not displacing it. We are rotating it. So there's a difference, right? So force becomes torque, and ds, which is our you know translation displacement, becomes rotation. theta final, right, so I'll put those in green because that's the way I had them labeled earlier. We're going from theta equals 90 to theta equals theta final, right? And because we know the torque formula is given right here, PE sine theta, we can actually solve this integral right now. So Mr. Shore is going to plug the PE sine theta into the integral. The P and the E are independent of the dipole. So P is a property of the dipole, but it is not dependent on the theta. Like you could, you could uh, take the dipole, put it in your nose, you could twist it around, throw it in the air like a throwing knife. It's not going to change the P. the P. The P is just QD, no matter how you twist it or turn it. So Mr. Shore is going to put the P outside. Uh, and then we have the integral. And then there's just going to be a sine theta um, and then a d theta. And this is all going from theta equals 90, uh, theta equals uh, 90 to theta final. Okay, so I kind of ran out of room. Mr. Shore is going to now finish up the uh, calculus here. It's pretty easy. Um, can you think of a function whose derivative is sine theta? Okay, the answer is yes, it's negative cos theta, right? Negative cos theta. Okay, so then what you're gonna do is you're gonna plug in the um, theta final and then the 90, and you're going to get this, PE. So when you plug in the theta final, you get negative cos theta final. When you plug in the 90, you get zero, negative zero, but zero nonetheless. And so you don't need it. And then you just, whoa, I just lost some important stuff. Sorry, guy. Let me, let me recopy that. It was PE, and this was a cos theta from 90 to theta final. Um, we did our substituting and subtracting ordeal. Uh, so we got PE times negative cos theta final minus zero, which we're saying is just minus zero. And you'll notice that this can be written as negative PE cos theta, where just think of theta as the final angle. Since the, we started at 90, just think of theta as the final position.
there are naturally occurring dipoles. Uh, we have water molecules, for example. I mentioned this already. You have an oxygen and you have two hydrogens, right? And when these bond together, what happens is the the Should remind you of force dot distance anyway, but but an awesome field. So 